So I've put a few links in the chat for everybody for the uh, downloads and things like this. So uh, um, I don't know um, if everybody has installed all the software, but it's uh, there if you haven't. Yeah, I'll probably go to the web page at the beginning and show people where to. Just, okay, uh, that's good. Just, yeah, as part of the intro. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll just say a few words uh, of introduction and then hand over to you then. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So this meeting, uh, these workshops. Um, last year, uh, CCAG ran a five day meeting on uh, open chemical science. And this was uh, three separate intertwined strands, one on uh, open data, one on open publishing, but also a, a strand on workshops. And these workshops actually turned out to be incredibly popular. And so we felt that it was a thing that we should continue. So what we've tried to do is identify uh, open source software packages, which we think will be of general interest and then organize two hour workshops for each of these. And what we're seeing today is the first of the uh, first of the series of four workshops. There'll be more later on in the year. I should say right at the start that we're very grateful that uh, um, Liverpool Chirochem are quite generously sponsoring these events, which allows us to cover all of the uh, admin side of things. There's a couple of housekeeping things. Um, all attendees are on mute, so uh, you won't be able to uh, ask questions via the microphone. So I'll ask you to use the Q&A button and type in the questions. Um, we will then relay these to Tom at uh, suitable intervals. So uh, I've put some links in the chat for the downloads and things like this, but uh, we'll, we'll keep adding anything else we think will be more generally useful. So today we're joined by uh, Tom Goddard, Goddard and Elaine Meng. Uh, they're going to talk about uh, Chimera X. Tom's going to do most of the talking, but uh, Elaine will be there monitoring the questions and helping out uh, in, a more, in the background. Um, so with that, I think I'll hand over to Tom, ask him to share his screen and uh, take it away for us. Hey, thank you. Let me uh, do the screen share. All right, sorry, things are a little chaotic here because I had some trouble signing into Zoom. At, so I won't just signed in a minute before the meeting successfully. Okay, so my name is Tom Goddard. I'm, I'm here in San Francisco. Uh, we developed this program Chimera X at UC San Francisco. Um, let's, let me go to the Chimera X website. I'm just gonna type in Chimera X. The X is part of the word, there's no space, uh, and go to the Chimera X website. And here you can download the program. It's free for academic use. For companies, pharmaceutical companies and such, there is some commercial license. But there's a, this download link at the left is where you would download the program. OK, so there's some tables for Windows, Mac, and Linux there. It's a big download. If you haven't done it yet, um, it's going to take a little while, probably. Uh, don't worry about that. I encourage you to download it. I'm going to be going at a pace, uh, showing you a bunch of features at a at a slow enough pace so that you can try these things out yourself. Um, but it might be kind of boring because the pace is slow if you aren't trying it yourself. Um, so uh, this program, Chimera X, it's um, it's used a lot by the electron microscopy community to determine molecular structures of proteins and nucleic acids and complexes. Uh, it's used for many other molecular visualization purposes uh, and 3D light microscopy. Um, uh, it's developed by four, a team of four people at uh, UC San Francisco, um, Eric Pedersen and Greg Couch and Elaine Mang and myself. And Elaine is here. Elaine works on all of our documentation and writing tutorials. And um, she'll be looking at your questions and passing them to me. Um, Thank you very much, Chris, for setting this up, setting up this whole series and inviting us to present. Um, and how about we get going on and uh, just dive in to Chimera X. 
Um, Elaine, do you actually, Elaine, can you, can you unmute and say hello? I don't know. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Well, when yeah, you're I'll in try the dark, to keep an eye on the questions and type in answers or send them to Tom as it happens. Yes, and feel free to interrupt uh, Lane or Chris if there is a, a question. I don't mind, like the more questions, the better. And I'm happy, I'm more, I'm happier to stop and answer questions than to just cruise on through. So please, yeah. at, you know, forward those questions to me. One, one thing I should have said was, um, it, could we have a break at about for about an hour just to get people to stretch their legs and things just for a couple oh, of minutes? Of course, I'll appreciate that too. So we'll have like a five minute, five to 10 minute break at at, uh, at the hour, one hour in. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, if you're on the Chimera X page uh, on the left, there's a link under documentation to tutorials. So I'm gonna click that and uh, we have a bunch of tutorials here, and we're going to look at the third one down. It's called Nanobody X-Ray and EM Models. Okay, and uh, you're not going to need to uh, be looking at the details of this page for the most part, because if you, I'm going to be just showing you how to do these things in Chimera X, uh, but it's good to know where this page is. Um, these nanobodies, so uh, they are like a single domain kind of antibody. They're found in camels, alpacas, sharks, just a few animals. Um, and so they're about, being a single domain, they're about 10 times smaller than your typical uh, antibody, which has heavy and two heavy and light chains. And because they're much smaller, they're much easier to engineer. And so a lab here, uh, Ashley, a Ashish Manglik at UCSF, um, does, does protein engineering and design some nanobodies to uh, bind to the SARS coronavirus spike. And uh, he got incredible results with this by attaching three, stringing three of these nanobodies together to bind to the three receptors on the uh, coronavirus spike. He got like um, femtomolar binding affinity, just unheard of affinity. And so because the binding's so tight and these, uh, single domains are small, they could use it in an aerosol where you could just inhale this aerosol into your nose and it would completely neutralize the virus. So it's a pretty exciting um, like system that was figured out just months ago. Um, and um, it's, not, it's not in clinical use yet and that will probably take longer than uh, so long that it isn't gonna be useful during this pandemic. Uh, but it's an interesting system. So that's all the background I'm gonna tell you about that. All right, so I'm gonna start up Chimera X. I'm using one point, the 1 1.1 version. There's a, there's the, that's the current production version of the program. Um, there are daily builds on that download page. If you got those, that's good too. That ha those have even more features. Um, and, but I'm gonna use the 1.1 version because I think most of you probably downloaded that. And uh, let's see here, how, how will I go about this? I gotta manage my limited screen space. Uh, and um, okay, so I may be switching back and forth a little bit between the web browser. All right, so let's open one of these nanobody structures. Um, it's, it's uh, PDB I code, ID code is 7KKJ. So I'm gonna type into the command line at the bottom, open 7KKJ. And that will fetch it from the protein data bank. It came up really fast for me because I fetched it before and it gets cached in your downloads folder under Chimera X. Um, but it should come up pretty quick for you too. Um, and actually, let me ask, ask this to Elaine or, and or Chris, uh, do things look okay? Like you can see my uh, Chimera X and it looks like the size is good so that you can read commands and text. I can see it on my little laptop. Look good. Okay, good. So, um, so this is, a. Uh, a pair of these nanobodies. It was done by X-ray crystallography. They don't normally bind to each other in this way. Uh, so it's just that there were two in the crystal asymmetric unit. Um, the first thing you useful thing is to be able to rotate this and move it around. Um, I'm on a Mac laptop. 
so I have a trackpad, and um, well, I can click and rotate, uh, and but I can also use two fingers or three fingers or four fingers dragging on the laptop. Uh, this is and this is just on Mac laptops that have this uh, Chimeric supports this multi-touch. So if I drag with two fingers on the on the touchpad, it rotates, and with three fingers, it translates in X and Y. And with four fingers, I can move four fingers up and down on the trackpad. This is kind of a weird one to zoom in and out. You don't need to use this multi-touch. Um, uh, you can also rotate just by clicking and dragging. And if you, uh, again, on the Mac, if you hold the command, the command key down and drag on my touchpad, then it translates. Um, on a Windows, say, laptop, um, unfortunately, our window toolkit doesn't handle the multi-touch events on Windows. We use the QT window toolkit. So um, there you have to, you can click and drag. And I think you use the Alt key in order to translate. And if you do a two finger drag on your Windows laptop, it's gonna zoom in and out. That's like a scrolling operation, okay? You might have a mouse, uh, left mouse button would rotate and right mouse button would translate. And if you had a scroll on your mouse, that will zoom in and out. Okay, so depending on what system you're on, there's some different ways to move, but I wanted to at least discuss that a little bit because it's pretty, critical to the whole visualization to be able to move around well. Um, let me show you one little trick. Um, I, can, I can rotate to the left uh, about the, X, the Y axis by dragging left and right or about the X axis, but how do I, sometimes I wanna rotate around the Z axis, the one perpendicular to the screen. Like if I wanted to get these two nanobodies side by side, uh, a way to do that trick is if you click near the edge of the, the, the graphics window, this black area, the black panel, and I, if I then click and drag then it, near the edge, like within 10% of the edge or so, then it will rotate about the z-axis. Okay. All right, so that's a little bit about moving. Um, I didn't mention, I don't think I mentioned, uh, we're gonna look a good bit at atomic models first of, the, of this protein. And then we're gonna look at X-ray density map. This structure was determined by X-ray crystallography. And then uh, I think after the break, we'll look at electron microscopy of the SARS coronavirus spike with this nanobody bound. Uh, okay, so, um, so let's take a closer look at what we've got in this, this structure. Um, in the log panel, what you see at the right, um, it's, kind of, it's like an HTML window. It has links in it. It has the command I typed, open 7KKJ. It records all of the actions you do, which can be useful. Um, it, and under that, it lists the chains. So there are two chains in this structure, A and C. And if I click the A, that it's a blue link there, it will select chain A and similarly chain C. Uh, the link that says synthetic nanobody, that would show a sequence. I'm not gonna do that right now. We'll look at the sequence later. Um, so there's chain A and C. Another way, if I just hover the mouse over the structure, I'm hovering it over the ribbon on the left, it pops up a little balloon and it says what I'm hovering over. It says chain A that it, it uses the slash character for chain. So slash A glycine residue 35. So you can just hover over with the mouse over um, residues or over individual atoms to see, you know, what specific residue, what, spe what specific uh, atom you're, you're on. Underneath this chain table, there's another table. It says non-standard residues. So it says I have a chloride ion and it says sulfate. Uh, sulfate ion. If I click on the CL, um, it will, uh, it, which it should highlight it with that green highlight, and I don't see it here. Um, I was puzzled by this at first, but if you notice, we're not showing all the atoms. Chimera X, when you load up a structure, it tries to give you a kind of intelligent display, and so it doesn't show all of the atoms. It wants to give you a, a good overview, and it didn't show this chloride. So 
I clicked on CL and it did select it, but it's not shown. In order to show it, if we look at the top of the, the icons at the top, the toolbar, um, it says uh, file and images and atoms, different categories. And under atoms, it says show and hide. If I click the show under above atoms on the toolbar, then it, because this chloride I selected it, it will show the chloride atom. So we've got that green ball in the middle, it's the chloride. In the table, we have a number of sulfates. If I click the SO4 here, it will select those. Um, in Chimera X, there are a lot of ways to act on the selection, and we're going to see that in a little bit here. Um, uh, but um, this I'm showing you in the log is just a nice way when you have a complex structure to see what's there. It, maybe we have some ligand, some drug bound to a, a protein. Um, all right. Um, below that, there's a table called assemblies. And um, uh, these often give the biologically relevant assembly. And so right now we have these two nanobodies, but um, they don't bind as a dimer like this. I, I believe that's true. I'm actually not totally certain. I, I believe that it's just a crystal packing um, because there's relatively small interface between these two. Um, uh, if in the assemblies table, it says there are two assemblies, number one and two. If I click the one, that will show me the first assembly. And it shows me just one of the nanobodies. OK, so an assembly might be just a subpart of the structure you open. More typically, the assembly is like an oligomer. Some um, You might have a virus capsid, and you open up the asymmetric unit, which is 1 60th of your icosahedral virus. and then the assembly will make the whole virus capsid, OK? Um, let's click on number two here. And I'm curious what this other assembly is. OK, that, that has uh, both nanobodies, OK? So it says author-defined assembly. These assemblies aren't, uh, are just, you know, the author decides, hey, these are two interesting assemblies. When we clicked those, um, it made new copies of the model. And those appeared uh, below in a panel that's titled Models. So at the top of that panel, here I just selected the line, it says 7KKJ. That's the original structure we opened. But when we clicked those assembly links, it created this, uh, the next line, 7KKJ assembly one. I'm going to close that now um, because we're not going to use it further. So if I select that line, assembly one, and press the close button, to the right, there's a quote, there are four buttons. We'll close that. And I'm going to close assembly two. And well, now it's nothing shown because when I made those assemblies, it hid the first one. Uh, so on the first line, there's an icon, um, there's a little check button. It's beyond the little brown uh, color square. That brown color square lets you color the molecule, but the check button beyond shows and hides it. So that's how I can show and hide it. I was telling you before that when you do things in Chimera X, it logs all the commands. So for instance, as I, I press that button, it said in the log panel here, it says show number one models, okay? So that's the equivalent typed command to show uh, that show th that displayed this hidden model. Um, and you see close commands above, close number two, close number three. Um, the individual models, we had three of them, uh, we had the first one that we opened, the 7KKJ, these two nanobodies, and then the two assemblies. And they get numbered, number one, number two, number three. And so in a typed command, you would refer to them with these numbers. We're going to do a few typed commands uh, today. but And that's advanced users would probably use a fair number of hand typed commands because you can specify lots of options and things. But today, we're mostly going to look at the toolbar and use a ton of these toolbar buttons. And I was pretty amazed when I made this tutorial that uh, I thought, my god, I went through all those steps, and it was almost all just pressing toolbar buttons. Uh, it was just strange. I mean, I, in our older program, Chimera, which you may be familiar with, it doesn't have this toolbar. And it's a really nice uh, improvement to the user interface. OK. Any questions, folks? 
Think about your questions. Let me go look at what we're looking at next. I think we're going to do some uh, look at some different styles of display. There's a, a question you might be could answer perhaps. Can we duplicate the assemblies, for example, of just these two units, duplicate these and have four or six or more? Uh, so, um, oh, oh, but in a, like in a, a form of a, like an oligomer, like if I wanted to pack four of them together, perhaps, or, or are we, are you thinking more of the like crystal unit cell? I presume crystal unit cell, yeah. Okay, so uh, darn it. Um, I'm using the Chimerics 1.1 version, which is only from, uh, it's from September. And the crystal unit cell can be made. I can pack more, co um, I can pack more copies in multiple crystal unit cells in the daily build version. <laughs> Yeah, I sent, the, I sent an answer with a link to the unit cell and said they need to get the daily build. Oh, good. Okay, so it's in the it should be in the chat if somebody wants to try it. If, it's or in if the Q and A thingy, Majigger. Which oh, Q &A? yeah, there's two okay. things. There's chat and Q and A. I've never used. Okay, this it's Q &A separate. Thing All right, before. cool. So there's a link in the Q and A to um, to um, where you can see that that new feature in the daily build. Um, that's a good question. Um, Okay, uh, any other questions on anything we've, I know we're just getting started here. Okay, uh, let well, me- uh... but, but One of the questions which I suspect sure. you may be color coming up is um, color coding the um, ribbon view. Oh yeah, we're gonna do a whole section on color coding. It's it's the yeah. section after this. First, yeah. I'm gonna show some display styles, like how yeah, to, and then we'll look at coloring in a bunch of different ways. Good, okay, that'd be good. Good, qu good question just one step ahead of me. Okay, uh, so um, let's uh, let's just look at some different styles of display. So we're showing a ribbon here, the protein backbone. And I can, um, if we look at the toolbar, let's try some of these toolbar buttons to change the style. So we looked at showing, we showed that chloride atom with under atom show. I can say, so there's hide too, I can hide atoms. I have the sulfate selected from click, clicking that SO4 link. And so it just hid the sulfates. And if I say show, it will show them again. Um, suppose I wanna um, act on all of the, like show all of the atoms. For that, if you don't have anything selected, then these toolbar buttons um, will act on everything that's being shown. So how do I unselect my sulfates? Well, um, the, a normal way to select thing is to hold the control key and click. So I can hold the control key and click on part of the ribbon and it outlines just that residue. But if I hold the control key and click on the background, it will clear the selection. I have selected nothing. Another way to do that, um, we'll be using this kind of selection a little bit later on. Another way to clear the selection, they're meant in the Chimera X menus, I can say select, and there are a bunch of options here, about halfway down, there's clear. There are always a lot of ways to do things. I could type a command and clear the selection too. Uh, so there are many ways to do these. But now that I've cleared the selection, if I say show atoms I, on the toolbar, I click that show button under, above atoms, it will show all the atoms. Uh, so somebody's color... asking, uh -huh. um, can you render with the GPU? Yeah. So. Uh, all of the Chimera X 3D rendering we're seeing is being rendered with the GPU. If you have like a laptop and it just has uh, like Intel CPU and no separate GPU, it will use the Intel GPU. If you have some fancier laptop that has Intel and a separate NVIDIA GPU or something, it will use the NVIDIA GPU. And um, we're going to show some fancy lighting in a second that will really heavily use the GPU because it's going to cast a lot of shadows and things. So good question. Um, OK, so we, we've shown the atoms. How about we hide the ribbon? Um, another word for these ribbons is cartoons. Right next to the atoms on the toolbar, it says cartoons, show and hide. So I can click hide, and it will hide all the, the, uh, those cartoons. Uh, the next thing on the toolbar it shows some different styles. So we're showing these in stick display style. Uh, I guess this, I'm sure you guys know this stuff, but these atoms are just colored by 
like standard coloring, oxygens being red, nitrogens being blue. Um, this structure is a little bit unusual in that it has hydrogens. Um, I was told uh, when I was talking to um, Ashish that uh, about his structure here, why, I said, why do you have hydrogens on this? The X-ray data isn't really high enough resolution to see those hydrogens. And he says the protein data bank requests hydrogens now on the X-ray structures. They prefer to have structures with hydrogens. I didn't know that. So anyway, standard colors, the, the hydrogens are shown as white here, this chloride green, there's some sulfurs as yellow, okay? So back up to the toolbar under styles. Uh, this is stick style, right? The bonds are shown as these cylinders. Uh, if we go to, if we click sphere, so the atoms are shown with their uh, Van der Waals radii. Um, and then there's ball and stick, okay? So smaller atoms, but the atoms are bigger than the little cylinders, bond cylinders. Let me go back to spheres. Um, this is a kind of typical old style lighting for molecular graphics and um, everything's brightly lit and there aren't shadows being cast. And that makes it hard to see the three-dimensional structure of this. And one of the nice features of Chimera X is it has some pretty fancy lighting. So a little further along the, at the right edge of your toolbar, it says lighting and it says simple. That's the kind of lighting we're looking at now without shadows. And if you click soft, lighting, also called ambient lighting. This casts shadows from a lot of different directions. The, it's, the idea is it casts shadows from all directions. Um, but in reality, it's only 64 directions, I think it's using by default. But what it does is it darkens all the crevices in the structure. And so you get a much better three kind of three-dimensional look. This is especially useful when you're making images for a presentation, a talk and you can't rotate it around for your audience to be able to see the three-dimensional depth well. Then the next uh, button under lighting, it says full lighting. Let me switch to that. That's a combination of this ambient lighting, shadows from all directions, and there's one spotlight. Uh, I think it's kind of over your left shoulder that casts a shadow. So the molecule you might be able to see, cast, especially if you rotate it around, casts a shadow onto itself. And that can also give you better perception of depth, especially when it's just a, a you know, a 2D image instead of a moving structure. Uh, most often for a publication, um, if it's a space filling model like this, I would use the soft lighting. Um, but it really depends on what you're showing. You don't always use that. So for instance, if we go back to cartoons, I'm gonna click the hide atoms and show button on the cartoons. Here, the soft lighting doesn't really do much because I'm, although I'm casting shadows from lots of directions, um, the model is very sparse and the light just passes through and it ends up looking just a little bit smudgy. Um, like little dark smudges on there. And so here I would use simple lighting pro probably for this kind of sparse depiction. Um, all right. Okay, so that's a little bit about display styles. Um, let's see here, what's, what's next? Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Okay, uh, so I wanted to show you, I said we select by holding the control key down and clicking. If I hold the control key and click on this on this ribbon. It highlighted one residue here um, of the ribbon. Let me zoom in a little bit. So you might be hard to see that green outline. Hopefully you're following along and you can see it on your computer. It's very thin green outline. Um, if, um, if I click the up arrow key on the keyboard, it will then expand that selection. Now it's, it's selected. It's put a green outline around this whole beta strand. And if I click up arrow again, it select the whole chain, okay? And I can click the down arrow key on the keyboard and just go backwards now, back to the beta strand, back to the individual residue. Let me go up back to the chain. If I've got the chain selected, these buttons that on the toolbar, almost all of them act specifically on what's selected, okay? So um, unless nothing is selected, in which case they act on everything. So now if I click show atoms with, one of the chains selected, then I have just one chain shown as atoms. And I could 
click hide cartoon. So I've shown atoms for the one chain where I have ribbon as the other chain. And the same deal, I can uh, change the style of display. So if I control click on the other ribbon, uh, I, I click up on the, um, on uh, the I, arrow once I got this beta strand. Actually, let me show you a different example. Maybe I want to color that beta strand. I wanted to highlight it. I could go to this actions menu, color, and I could say color it yellow. Okay. The actions menu is another way um, of acting on the selection. And there are many things you can do, show and hide atoms, a lot of the same things that you can do in the toolbar. As I was telling you, there are multiple ways of doing almost anything in Chimera X. Um, so you can show and hide surfaces. We're going to look at surfaces a little bit later um, and uh, color things. OK, so that's a little bit about selecting, up arrow and down arrow, control click. Those are, those are the important things to know. Um, let's see. All right, so now let's do get to the question about coloring. Let's do a bit of coloring. And we're going to look at a, a number of nice ways we can color these structures. Um, so the toolbar at the top, we've been um, seeing the home tab of the toolbar. And these little, it's, this is kind of bizarre. You probably never saw this in any other software. Uh, but there are different tabs to the toolbar, and you click on these tabs to switch between them. So the next one says molecule display, and nucleotides, and graphics, and map. But we got a ton of icons here. Um, so let's click on the molecule display tab, and it can do some. It can do some of the things that were in that home tab. The home tab is just some generally useful things like showing and hiding atoms. We have those in this molecule display. Um, um, to, um, toolbar at the left. Uh, and then it says surfaces, styles, and coloring. Let's look at coloring a little bit. So um, I'm going to press the color, the chain, color by chain. So it's the second um, icon in the coloring. You see, it just colored my, um, my beta strand that I had selected because it works just on the selection. I actually wanted to color the whole structure. So let me clear the selection. I could say select clear or control click on the background. Or you see in the log, it says select clear. That would be the command. Um, and now if I click this color by chain icon, then it colors each chain a different color. That's not super interesting for this structure. That's more for when you have a CRISPR complex, which with has 20 chains. And you just need to see like all of the different chains, uh, the boundaries between them, and get get oriented. Um, if it, let's click the button next to chain under color and it says hetero atom, this colors all of the all of the non-carbon atoms um, by their element type. So oxygen's red, nitrogen's blue, the hydrogens. It leaves the carbons their original color. Um, Next, uh, next icon, we're going to just sort of run down the line here on these coloring ones just to give you an idea. Chimerix has a ton of features, and in this little tutorial, we're going to cover some of the common ones, uh, but there are so many. Um, but so part of the purpose of this um, webinar is to just get a sense of like some of the things that Chimerix does, just to know that it can do those things. Uh, so I'll click the rainbow button, and this colors from the N terminus to the C terminus of the protein. This helps you see the path of it. Usually you do it with a ribbon display, not with this atom display. So let me switch to all ribbons. So uh, in the toolbar at the far left, the mo molecule display toolbar, I'll say hide atoms. And then on, on just to the right of it, cartoons, I'll say show cartoons. All right, so it goes from blue at the end terminus, and we just follow the back bound to red. All right, that's rainbow. Um, and let's see, let me just make sure I, if, if there was anything else I wanted to, oh yeah, uh, important one. So if I've messed with the coloring like this, and then I just wanna get back to that original um, coloring and the original display 
of, you know, it was showing those sulfate um, um, groups and uh, a few side chains uh, originally. Chimeric tried to do this smart initial display. How do I get back to that? Well, if I go to the, there's a presets menu at the right. And um, under initial styles, I think this looks a little different in the daily build if you have that, but you'll find it. There's, there's an entry called original look. So I, for me here, it's under presets, initial styles, original look. And that just gets me back to the colors and which atoms are being shown and which are, cartoons are being shown brings me back to the original appearance from when I opened the structure, the smart display appearance. Um, there are a lot of other interesting presets. Uh, let me show you one that um, it's not, uh, well, yeah, okay, I'll show it to you now. It might be, it would look better on the spike protein. This one shows, uh, there's one that I like a lot that shows helices as cylinders. Uh, so if I go under presets, uh, but, 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 yeah, under cartoons at the very top, and then it says cylinders and stubs. The stubs refers to how it displays nucleic acids. We don't have any of those here, but this will show the alpha helices as these cylinders, which if you're trying to get sort of a lower resolution depiction, a more overview, uh, that can be useful, especially this structure is most, these nanobodies are mostly beta sheet. Um, so we don't have many helices. So it's not particularly useful here, but some structures are primarily alpha helices and that, this can really simplify the display. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go back to original look. Oops, it didn't change my, interesting. It didn't change my helices back from cylinders. Uh, okay, no, no, no problem. Um, Let's take a look at some sur at surfaces now and some coloring on surfaces or coloring that you typically do on surfaces. So to display a molecular surface of these structures, uh, on the toolbar, the third, the third uh, category here, it says surfaces. I just click the show button. And this is a solvent excluded surface. So rolling a water molecule across the protein and seeing where it can, a water molecule can reach. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I see the alpha, my cylinder alpha helices poking through. Uh, I'm going to just hide the cartoons. Here we go. When you have a surface display, that soft lighting, the shadowed lighting improves the like appearance, the depth. I'm going to switch back to the home tab for just a second here and click that soft lighting just show you what it looks like uh, with the soft lighting. Now back to the molecule display tab. Uh, let's see here. Uh, zoom always drops the little, this little zoom bar and it blocks some of my menus. So I had a little trouble getting to the, the toolbar. Um, okay, so, uh, so back to the coloring tab, let's look at electrostatic coloring. Um, so there's a button right in the middle of the coloring section. And if I click that, uh, it, it gave me some message in the log uh, in red, not, not good. Uh, it says uh, atoms with non-standard names found in standard residues, uh, so cysteine, and it has a HG, like a, the hydrogen, the gamma position. Apparently that's not the standard name. And this electrostatic coloring, it's doing something pretty simplistic. It's looking up, um, it works with the standard amino acids and it has some preset charges for them. Um, and um, apparently this isn't the standard name for that, pro that hydrogen. I'm not sure what it is, but because it's using some templates, it needs to have the standard names. It's kind of weird that it doesn't, if it's the protein data bank. Um, I think in the daily build, this actually, the coloring just works. Um, maybe this was Chimeric's bug, but it says how to fix it here. It says um, you can try deleting all the hydrogens. And then it, the electrostatics won't be confused by this, what it thinks is a wrong hydrogen name. So how would I do that? Um, I could type a command. That's one of the easiest ways. It's delete space and then capital H. 
okay? The capital H means all, um, you know, hydrogen elements, atoms that are hydrogen. So if I do that, uh, I saw my surface changed a little bit. It adjusted the surface because now the hydrogens aren't there. Um, and if I click the, after I've done that, I can click the electrostatic coloring and uh, then we get this blue and red coloring. So the red is negatively charged. The blue is positively charged. Um, this isn't directly a translation of the charges from the atoms onto the surface. There's some distance. It's some coulombic, you know, one over r squared one type type fall off. Um, it's some sort of heuristic because um, you have screening um, from pol you know polarizability and such. But it gives a pretty good result if you compare it to the like using. Um, Poisson Boltzmann uh, solver to get better electrostatics and handle the polarizability better. Um, it gives a pretty similar appearance. Um, I right uh, now, double check. You... Sorry, yeah. I double checked and it it does work on that structure in the daily build without any mess error message. Yeah, so we made some change. Uh, you got. Uh, by the way, if you end up using chimerics, I I strongly encourage you to use the daily build. There. Like already there are like 10 features I miss by using this September build um, of just, you know, a five, five month old version of the program because we're constantly adding new things. Um, okay, so, um, so red is negative, blue is positively charged. One thing I thought was curious about this structure um, is if you look at the interface between the two copies of the nanobody, um, let me zoom in here. You see this red patch here and this blue patch right against each other. So you have negative and positive charges there. That's going to give you a good favorable electrostatic interaction. They're going to attract each other. If you rotate around, uh, there's not exact symmetry, but you see we also have a red, even darker red and blue patch on this side that are right in contact with each other. Possibly that electrostatic interaction is contributing to why the crystal actually packed in this way. Um, in a real, in a situation where you really had a dimer, um, it would be it would be more interesting to see if there are some like um, per potentially favorable electrostatic interactions that that like make that binding interface hold together. All right. Um, Let's go to another kind of coloring often done on surfaces, um, the coloring tab. Uh, it says hydrophob hydrophobic, it's a little blue and yellow icon. So this is coloring by hydrophobicity. So the bluish, bluish green color is hydrophilic, okay? Likes to be exposed to the water and the yellow is hydrophobic. Um, this is, uh, this would be particularly useful, say, if you had a, a transmembrane protein. So um, you would see that the region of the protein in the membrane would be mostly the orange color. So it's hydrophobic. It wants to be buried in the membrane. And so this coloring gives you a nice depiction. You see very clearly where your transmembrane protein sits in the membrane. These aren't these anti these um, nanobodies, of course, aren't transmembrane, um, but you actually see some, I thought it was interesting to see, to, to see at the interface between our two, um, our two monomers here. Again, I, I see yellow patches packed against yellow patches, which is what you see. You see hydrophobic areas that pack together so that they aren't exposed to water. That gives a favorable energetic, energetically favorable interaction. On the other side here, it's even clearer. We have, hydrophobic patches packed against each other. So it looks to me like this crystal packing also like is maybe somewhat driven by uh, hydrophobic, like favorable bearing of hydrophobic surface area. This thing is, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's using something called molecular lipophilicity potential, MLP. And just remember the acronym. I think I have that right. Um, lipophilicity, so kind of the opposite of hydrophobicity, how much you like lipids. And um, it uses some distance cutoff and templates for the different residues too. Um, all right, one last coloring. Um, in the coloring tab, there's color by B factor. Uh, let's click that one. So B factors are uh, 
when you have an x-ray structure, you probably most of you know this, but just for some who might not, uh, um, the when you have an x-ray structure in the crystal, some of the atoms are more mobile than others. And so for instance, in this structure here at the periphery, these red ones are more mobile um, in the crystal. And that means you end up seeing more smeared out and lower intensity values in the density map. Um, and um, that's measured by this B factor. And here, the blue regions are regions that are very solid. The atoms are not uh, very mobile. And red are the ones where you have higher mobility. Um, often you show this, you don't, it's not so typical that you show this on a molecular surface. You might show it on a ribbon. Um, uh, I, I could hide the surface using the, the toolbar here. Surface is hide. And then I could show a ribbon. This would probably be a more typical um, display to just see oh, I have a loop here, which is red. So this loop maybe is uh, moving around. Maybe it can even adopt different conformations. There is a qu question. Sure. This might be a good time. Uh, can we select a particular selection, ED, a binding site, and color the selection with the hydrophobic coloring, but not the whole protein? Ah, good question. Uh... I don't know. Is that Elaine? Do you know? Can you can you color just part of a, a molecule, but with the MLP? I, I'll, I'm going to try. Okay. So um, we don't have, um, you know, a, a use case of that is you might take a ligand. Okay. Let. Uh, okay. No, I'm not. Yeah, gonna, I don't know. Well, I do not know. Okay, we're going to try by experiment. I kind of here. have my doubts, like, or you might have to do something fancy, so, like you might have to color the whole thing by hydrophobicity first and then recolor the other part. I don't know. So it I, would I just selected hard. one chain, control click, up, up. Okay, this isn't exactly what the person asked because I don't have a binding site here, but I'll do a simplistic case. We'll just see if it works. I click, click, control click on one chain, up arrow a couple times to select that chain. And now I'm going to click the hydrophobic. Well, chain is different because it's a single service per chain. You would okay, need to do right, something right. so like a zone to test it. Okay, that's cheating. I'm going to select this one alpha helix here. Okay, selected one residue and up arrow. Now I'm going to try the hydrophobic surface on that. Okay, so it showed, um, what did it do? Um, the toolbar, yeah, so the hydrophobic visity is use, usually shown on surfaces. And so what it does, this MLP command, you see it in the log, it says MLP cell, uh, run MLP on the selected residues. It showed me just a patch of the surface around this alpha helix. So that might, um, and yeah, and, um, but that doesn't tell me actually whether it colored the other part of the surface. So, so, I show kind the, of, so I'm gonna show, show the, the whole surface. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm <laughs> gonna, First, I'm going to clear our selection, control click on the background, and then I'm going to say surface show. Oh, and it looks like it colored the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it looks like it doesn't do just one patch, but I don't know why, because I think it should be able to. I'm going to try one more time here. I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to, I just do color by chain, and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to try one more time here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to show my surface, all my surface. Uh, um, OK, so I'm going to do it because I have this. I want to leave the alpha helix selected. I'm going to show the surface. So, Tom, I yes. Uh, so I tried a little test. I can color the whole surface by MLP, but then I can recolor parts of it like I could I could recolor some other selected part. So if you could do MLP on the whole surface and then select the non-ligand binding part and like color it some other color. Okay, all right, good. And it looks like I just did the test again. Yeah, MLP, it doesn't want to do it on just a few residues, okay? But it, so yeah, as, you Elaine can... says, as Elaine says, I could instead color like all of it MLP here and then I can color the rest in a different way by giving it a single color, all right? So good good question. I'm not sure why that doesn't work. That's a little, 
it's a little strange to me that it doesn't, but um, I don't see any reason why it couldn't. Um, thanks for the question. Maybe we'll change, fix that. I'll have to think about it. Like maybe there was a reason why we preferred it doing coloring whole chains. Um, okay, um, that's some coloring. Um, I wanna show you a couple, two more things before our break. One is um, sequences. So Chimera X can display the amino acid sequence and you can interact with the sequence and the structure selecting parts of the sequence and see where those are on the structure. And I want to show you a little bit about x-ray, how to look at x-ray density maps in the next 10 minutes. So then we'll take a break. Okay, so let's display the sequence um, um, of this nanobody. I'm going to go to the menu tools, um, sequence. I have some extra menu entries that you don't have because I installed some plugins to Chimera X. Um, and then it says show sequence viewer. So let me do that. And I brought up a little panel because I actually have two chains here. And uh, you might be surprised, but they don't actually, I, well, actually they do have the same sequence. Okay, they do have the same sequence. They don't actually have all the same residues, but so I have to choose one of the chains to show the sequence. That's a little bit silly since they have the same sequence, but um, let me choose, just choose A and say show. And then the panel, this panel appears down on the right that's showing the sequence. I can move these panels around, by the way. I'm gonna move it a little bit higher on my display here. I can drag it and I can drop it somewhere else. This is a little bit finicky, but the window toolkit lets you move these. You can also drag the panel out. Um, and uh, so we got the sequence here of about 100 and what, 30 am amino acids. You see it's colored blue and uh, yellow boxes. Those are the beta strands are the blue and the yellow are alpha helices. If I drag a box, say around um, this, uh, this blue beta strand here, it will look, be, appear green and it's selected and it will have selected it in the structure. So I can see it here um, on this surface. Might be hard for you to see. Let's see, let me, uh, if I say hide surfaces, it, it hid the surface just associated with that selection. I just made a hole in the surface, okay? So you can select on the, actually, let me clear the selection. I'm gonna control click on the background. You see it, it unselected it in the sequence view as well. I'm going to hide the surfaces with the toolbar button. Surfaces hide. Okay. This is just so we can see our selections of parts of the sequence better. If I select one of these alpha helices, um, I can just control click and up arrow. And um, whoops, but I selected on chain C. Okay. The sequence we displayed was chain A. So I'm going to go over to this purple um, a chain A alpha helix and I select. And then I see here in the sequence where that is. Okay, I see the green outline box appear there. One more thing about these sequences, some of the residues weren't observed in this structure. So the crystal, the sample had certain residues. And I see this the, at, the, um, at the C terminus here, there's this black outline box. And that tells me that those residues are not in the structure. If I hover the mouse, it says no corresponding structure residue. I see uh, six histidines. Uh, this is probably like a hist tag used to purify the protein. Um, also, there's one additional residue that's not um, in the structure. It probably just wasn't resolved because it was disordered. That would be my guess. Um, okay, so that's a, a little bit. So as you can select, uh, you know, if you know particular things you're looking for in the sequence, you can select them on the sequence and vice versa. You can look at where particular selections on the structure uh, actually are in the sequence. You can also do things like multiple sequence alignments to compare related structures, look at sequence conservation. There are a whole range of things you can do with sequences. That could be a whole webinar all of it of its own. Uh, but this is all I'm going to show you now because um, the I, I prepared this tutorial for a class that was doing electron microscopy. So we're going to mostly focus on the map, on 
how to deal with map, electron microscopy, and some x-ray maps. OK, so let's look at the x-ray maps now. Um, that's it for sequences. Let's do a quick little look at x-ray maps, and then we'll have a break. So um, this structure came from x-ray crystallography. One way I, uh, you can see that is I'm going to scroll all the way to the top of my log. And um, it, it says um, more we're, after I did the open 7 KKJ and there were the chain table and such, it says the title of this entry was structure of anti-SARS spike nanobody and it says more info. If I click that more info link, that just gets some stuff from the PDB, like the relevant publication. I have the link to that um, science article. And, um, but at, in that tab table, it says it was, this structure was by x-ray diffraction, experimental method x-ray diffraction, 2.05 angstrom's resolution, not, not particularly high resolution. Um, how would I show the x-ray map? Well, the protein data bank provides those maps. And so we can fetch that. I can say open space 7KKJ. That's the PDB ID of the structure. But then I also say from uh, e space EDS. EDS is for electron density server. So let me do that. It came up instantly for you. It's going to have to fetch it. So it may take several seconds. Um, and it's this pink mesh we see now is the um, X-ray density map. And on the right, a new panel appeared, this volume viewer with a histogram. That's a histogram of the intensity values in this map. And this vertical pink bar on it shows the threshold level we're showing. I can click on that bar and drag it to show lower or higher threshold. Usually when we're looking at a map, we're gonna look at the atoms uh, and how the atoms fit into the map um, and whether they're well resolved in the map. And we're not gonna show these cartoons. And so let me get rid of the cartoons. Okay, usual rigmarole. I'm gonna clear the selection because I see I have a helix selected here. Control click on the background, cartoons up at the toolbar hide, atoms show. So I'm showing all the atoms. I think I'm gonna color it by uh, color it by, by uh, heteroatom. So I see my oxygens and my different atom types well. Um, I don't like my pink map color. Uh, I'm sort of surprised. I thought it would come up a white color. Uh, but I can change the color in this volume viewer. That little pink square uh, above the histogram is a color button. You'll see these in some different places in the Chimera X interface. And I click on that, it brings up this little color chooser. And I'm going to just make all the red, green, and blue components about the same. So my map is gray, just so I can more easily see the colored atoms against the map. OK. Now, this is showing the crystal unit cell. Um, and. Um, I can see that more or less. I can show an outline of it. If you go to the toolbars, um, there's one called the map toolbar. It's kind of in the middle. If I hit that, this has some buttons related to density maps. And um, under, so map toolbar, under the category style, it says outline box. It's the last one in the style. And that just draws this little outline. So the unit cell of this crystal is this skewed box. And it has um, two cop, the blue and green copy in the asymmetric unit, but it, you see it has half of a bunch of other copies um, of, the, um, of the nanobody. How do I get rid of, like if I wanna see the density clearly, I wanna see the density just near my atoms. So how do I do that? Um, in the daily build, there's just a tool, toolbar button in this map toolbar that I press. It says, uh, I think, zone. Uh huh. But I don't, I'm not running the daily build here, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to do it by command. Our, this older Chimera X 1.1 um, can only do it by command. So the command is uh, color, space, zone. Okay. The, the, the second thing, zone, is just like a sub command. Um, 
color space zone. And then I'll say the, I need to say, or sorry, I'm spacing out here. Um, wrong command. Uh, it's not coloring. We're going to do some, I think we're going to do that later. Volume zone, volume space zone. And then I tell it the, the ID number of this map that I want to zone, which is number two. It's the second thing I opened. So I say number space, number sign two. And then I have to say near number one. So show me a zone of map number two near number one, near the atomic model number one. OK. Um, let me let me hide my outline box. If I click that toolbar icon that showed that outline box, it will hide. It will then hide it. And now I can get a little bit clearer view of the density um, near the atoms. Um, but it's still pretty difficult because there's a lot of stuff on top of uh, on top of each other. A lot of atoms in the background. So. Um, Typically, in order to get a better view of how these atoms fit into the density, you would clip the front and the back, like hiding things in front and the back. So you're looking at only a little slab. So let's let's look at that. Um, to do that, if I go to Tools, General, and then Side View, this will bring up a little panel that is going to show. Um, the view from the side. I can resize these panels if I carefully like position the mouse between the boundary of like my volume viewer panel and the side view. It, the cursor will change and I can resize to make my side view bigger. Um, so this is showing a depiction of my models from like if we're looking at it face on in the main graphics area, we're looking at it from the side in the um, in this side view panel, the little square box uh, is the, is your, your camera or your eye. And you can move that forward and backward to zoom, or le sorry, left and right to zoom. And then there are these two vertical lines. These are the clipping planes that are going to allow us to show these slab. And so if I click on one of the vertical lines, the front the left one in the side view, that's the near clip plane. I can move it in. Ooh, it's moving like super slow. Um, the reason it's moving slow is because I have the soft lighting. I can see that too. The lighting looks kind of weird, smudgy. Um, and that, that has to update shadows whenever you change what's being shown. And that can be pretty slow. So let's fix that. Um, sometimes I have to turn off this, um, this soft lighting. So I'm going to go to the Home tab and click Simple Lighting. And this will make it more responsive when I move the clip plane. So now going back to the side view, if I drag this front clip plane, I can cut through. And I'm just going to drop it in the middle. And then if I move the back vertical line, the right vertical line in the side view, that's the back clip plane, I can show just a little slab here. And this gives me a much clearer view of the density around individual residues. Um, let me show you one last thing, and then we're, we're going to break. Um, in order to move this slab, well, I can move those lines. It's kind of painful. And there's a mouse mode to allow you to do it. Comerix has a lot of mouse modes. And many of them are under a toolbar tab. The, it says right mouse. So on the tabs, it's the, right, it's the one at the very far right. The reason it says right mouse is because when you click one of these buttons on the, one of these icons, it assigns that to the right mouse button, like if you had a mouse. I don't have a mouse. I have a trackpad. So I'm going to have to hold the command key down on my Mac. Or you might have to hold the alt key down on your Windows computer. Um, anyways, we've got a bunch of uh, mouse mode shown here. And in the middle, there's a category that says clipping. And the first one. It says is just says clip and it has two vertical red lines. That's the one I want. I'm going to click on that. It's shown in green now. That means it's assigned that mouse mode to my right mouse button, or 
So now if I hold the command key on the trackpad, I can use that and I can just drag in the window and move the clip plane. It's moving the front clip plane here. So if I push it very far, then I get a slab showing almost nothing. Um, usually I wanna move both clip planes when I'm looking at this, using it for this purpose. If I hold the shift key down, then it moves both clip planes in parallel. Okay, so I can just move further into the sample or further into the structure or away from it. All right, so that gives you an idea how you can um, navigate around a little bit in the X-ray density and show just a small region so that you get a clear view. Are there any questions so far? There is a question which says, with the near command, what radius does it use around the structure to display the volume? Can this be changed? Yes, um, that's a good question. And um, even I don't remember these darn things, um, these details. It might use a three angstrom radius or it might- I'll send, him, a I'll send him a link to the uh, man page. Yeah, let me, let me actually command. show you guys, because this is a super okay. useful thing, Elaine. Chimerix has an incredible amount of documentation and very thoroughly documented by Elaine, which is pretty exceptional for academic software, you know, university made software. Let me show you how you see that. So the command that did that was called volume zone. If I say help volume zone, I take that as a command, then it will bring up the web page for that. That gives me the detailed documentation. And there was a parameter range, it says here, that I could have specified. So that's part of the answer to your question. You can definitely specify it, and you're going to want to specify it um, to get the right distance. But yeah, it says here the default is three angstroms. Um, there's in Chimera Daily Build, there's a panel. You don't have to use this command. There's a zone um, tool that makes a little panel with a slider. The slider controls the range. Okay. Um, so that's another way to use it um, to do this zoning if you have the daily build. All right, uh, any additional questions? Not really a question, but just a comment. And that yes. the fact that uh, I, I think this is really useful because it's quite surprising how little density there is for some residues. And people seem to accept PDB files as being definitive. Yeah, I mean, the, like that's, I think that people often just work with the atomic model, but if you're looking at say a binding site and some residues are absolutely critical, you wanna know, are those actually even seen in the density or was it just some theoretical like force field calculation that put it there? Uh, yeah. Or you might see that it's in two different confirmations if you look at the density and the PDB only have the stronger confirmation. So it's really useful to look at this density when you really care about some details of the structures. So yeah. that's a very good point. Good comment. Okay. Okay. How about we take a, a five minute break? Is five minutes enough, Chris, or should it be a little more? I think five is fine. I think just okay. get people to walk well, around I, a bit. I, I have it eight minutes after the hour. Let's let's rejoin at 13 minutes after the hour. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, the other thing is um, Paul Coburn is uh, in the, one of the panelists and he's oh. from Liverpool. Kyra Kem. So I'd just like to invite him to just, uh, um, uh, well, to thank him really for sponsoring us for this thing and just say if he has any words to say. Uh, yes. No, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, Tom, Elaine, thanks so much for putting the, the webinar on. I'm really pleased that we've been able to, to sponsor it. Um, you know, I'm just looking at the participants. There's almost 100 participants, which means there must be thousands of, of users of the software, um, it resonates with me because you know it clearly reminds us that drug discovery is a three-dimensional challenge. And as a synthetic chemist, you know, you you sometimes struggle to visualize stuff in in three D. Um, ha having tools like this so readily available with with so many scripts as well, like you say, Tom, for for an academic software, I think that's just really really fantastic. And ju just quickly before you go for break, you know, LCC chose to sponsor this conference, but, you know, because we, we know how, how useful the, the tools are, but because we're trying to support this area as well. So we, we produce three dimensional chirally pure small molecule 
building blocks, fragments to, to try and support small molecule drug discovery. So if anyone wants to reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn or, or on our website at some point, we're happy to, to answer any questions. But yeah, essentially, we're trying to help plug and play chemical space to to explore three dimensional chirally pure chemical space with with uh, with all that kind of headache of you know absolute stereochemistry and chiral purity taken away so hopefully it'll it'll help some of you guys in the future but that, that's all i wanted to say and uh, let everyone go on for the break thank you chris all right i'll see you in a few minutes then yeah let's make it eight, eight let's make it 15 minutes after the hour okay then that so people good. have enough time to actually you know do what they need to do okay that's good good and thanks thanks to paul uh for um supporting this like it's a good bit of work for chris to organize these webinars and i'm sure the support like makes it possible that's really great thank you yeah Anything I missed, Elaine, like uh, in terms of that is a must show that I should squeeze in on the next half? Actually, they kept me super busy with the questions and stuff. So I was just like, uh, oh, we, you know, paying was a, half my brain was going with you. I love to have the questions. So it was a good number of questions. You know, if it were twice as many, then um, we would have been kind of getting far behind. But um, but still, no, I'm answering a lot of them just in the Q and A thingy without pestering you about it. Yeah, but but you know, if you think it's a benefit to many people, that do pester sure, me because sure. I'd rather I'd rather skip material at the end and answer people's questions because I think um, their questions are like are often more relevant to like the whole audience than the pre prepared stuff. Usually I'm just like, oh no, where am I going to find it? Yeah. <laughs> or I'm not sure and I have to try it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then, so I don't want to slap it on you because you wouldn't be sure either. So, <laughs> no, but that's okay. I, I don't mind. I don't mind looking yeah. foolish and not knowing my own software. Actually, I, I guess that, like, I think that they'll get the right idea that there's just so many features of the software that it's hard to, like, know every, keep every detail of it. And, in mind, uh, and I, 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 you know, I think it's really important that they know that the documentation has all these details, because they're probably used to using most academic software where you just can't find the details because it hasn't been written down. So it's very, very true. I mean, I think documentation is often a very unappreciated part of the uh, software projects, and quite often not funded. Yeah, yeah, this and this is like really key to our success. I think that that um, like users can find you know there we have like tens of thousands of users of our Chimera and, and our and Chimera X and um, the fact that they can actually find you know what they need to do without asking us and we'd be overwhelmed with questions if if we had to answer all their questions. So I'll try to show some more documentation in the next half part if it if quest if things arise where just to um, give that clear message that the documentation will really answer most of your questions. You have a user forum as well. Yes, we do. Um, uh, it's a kind of old-fashioned mailing list sort of deal. Okay. It's Chimera X dash users. I can I can mention that. I'll try to. Um, yeah, mentioned that maybe at, at the end for yeah. Um, and there there are a bunch of very detailed tutorials. This this particular tutorial I showed the web page at the beginning. This nanobody tutorial. It's very sketchy. Like it might be a little tricky to follow. That web page was really my notes for presenting it to a class. Um, yeah. Uh, but Elaine's tutorials are like give a lot more detail and a lot more explanation. And so I'll try to point out at the end, yeah, both the mailing list and that these other tutorials um, cover a lot more topics. 
like for instance the sequence I, you know i just skim over these things in just a few minutes and um doesn't do them justice see elaine's been busy answering all the questions in the q a so we're up to date now yeah let me take a glance at where i am and we'll get we'll get started just I forgot that I usually uh, will do these webinars or presentations with a second screen so I can have my notes on a second screen. But because it was dark when I woke up here in California, <laughs> I like, wasn't quite uh, on top of things and set that up. So I have to look, share the screen with my web browser here. All right, so we're gonna look at the spike some image saving, maps, optimizing the fit, color, and, okay. Okay, should we, should we get started again? Yeah, sounds good. Could you transfer it? Okay, so um, from Chimera, Elaine, maybe you could oh, mute. Oh, you mean it's in Chimera and he doesn't have the original files? Hey, Elaine, could you mute? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so let's get going again, and uh, we're going to move on to the electron microscopy, and we're going to look at a structure of the virus, the spike, the SARS coronavirus spike. So, um, to start out with, I, I'd like to close. Um, these models, and because um, we're going to look at some new ones. We don't have to close them, but um, just to keep things a little cleaner and a little simpler. Um, one way to do that is to type the command close. I could use the model panel over here. Uh, there are other probably menus I could do it, but the command close does the job. And then let's open a structure of the uh, SARS coronavirus 2 spike with this nanobody bound. The PDB ID is 7KKL. So I say open space 7KKL. Okay, that, this structure is a little bigger, may take you a few more, a few more seconds to it's being fetched for you. As I mentioned before, for me, I, it's already cached because I fetched it before. Um, so here's a Here's what this the spike looks like. And um, on the top, we see some different colored blobs that are the nanobodies. The spike is a trimer. Okay, it's made of three copies, symmetrical of the, this pro, of the spike protein. Um, and we have three nanobodies, one bound to each of those um, spike proteins. So how about we color um, the nanobody? So I got, they're in three different colors here. It's done, the initial smart display has colored it by um, chain, I guess. Um, I also, in this smart display, I see if I zoom in, I see there are a bunch of carbohydrate, they're glycans here. So the spike is covered with glycosylation. In fact, these, uh, these glycans would probably be about 10 times bigger, but they're very floppy. And so they're mostly not resolved, just the base of the glycan. But to give you an idea, this thing's really heavily glycosylated. That's important for the immune response. Like an antibody or these nanobodies aren't gonna be able to reach the surface of the spike when these big glycan glycans are covering it. Um, but at the top, there's an opening to, and that's where most of the antibodies and, and these nanobodies bind. Let's color them uh, all the same color. Um, how would I do that? Um, Actually, let me do a little cleanup here. I'm gonna, over on the panels, I'm gonna X out this side view one, okay? On the title bar, the little X. This little volume viewer one, I'm gonna close that one. I just wanna make some more room for the log. I'm gonna like make the model panel smaller by dragging right on the line right between the two. And I see in the log, now that I've opened this, I've changed A, C, and D are the spike glycoprotein and B, E, and F our synthetic nanobody, okay? So this nanobody we were looking at it, the x-ray structure of. 
let's color them. How would I color them? Uh, there are different ways. I could know, I know the chains B, E, and F, and I could type a command. Let me do it a different way. I'm going to control click to select one of the atoms of the nanobody. And then I, I can add to the selection. I can add, select another atom. I'm going to select an atom of another one by holding the shift key, control and shift and click. And I select, uh, say, one on this of this orange um, copy of the nanobody. And I'll hold the shift key and I'll add a third atom. Um, for the third copy, the gray one of the nanobody. So holding the shift key allows you to add to the selection. Now I've got an atom selected on all three of them. And if I click the up arrow key a few times to at selecting probably a helix and then three times, I've got my three nanobodies selected. And then I could go say to actions, uh, color, um, I don't know, yellow. Okay. Another way to do it, I could type command. I could say, just to give you an idea, color um, slash. That would be slash means chain. That is the indicator that I'm going to type chain identifiers. B, comma E, comma F. Those are the ones I saw in the log. Or I could hover the mouse over these um, nanobodies and see what their chain identifiers are. And then I space. Uh, let's say color gold, okay, slightly different color. All right. Okay, that's just to get a better view of the nanobodies, how they're distinguished them from the spike. Um, whoops. I see I just accidentally clipped the thing, uh, I guess because I have my clip mouse mode on and I held the alt to I'm not sure how that, that actually happened. I'm going to turn the clipping off by saying, actually, I think if I just hold the command key and I click on the background and release when I'm in that clipping mode, or if you had it bound to the right mouse button, you just click and release without dragging, and then it turns off the clipping. OK, that probably didn't happen to you, though. Um, all right, so this is what the spike looks like. Um, sorry, let me glance. what. What was the next segment that I want to show, color that? Oh, yeah, OK. Let's do a little, um, how would I save a nice image of this? Suppose I want to um, put an image in a talk and explain, where, show where this nanobody is bound. So I would often use a white background for such an image, like if it were in a presentation, an article. Um, if I go to the Home tab of the, on the toolbar, there's background color. There's a white and black. I can click white. Um, I'm going to save an image, and the image is going to be sized according to what I see on the screen. And so it's kind of tall. I'm going to make my, my window a little narrower so it matches the size of my structure a little better. And um, there's something called silhouette edges. It's under the graphics toolbar. So it's the graphics tab of the toolbar. And there's a little seahorse icon that says silhouettes. If I click that, it makes a little black outline around the, the structure. And actually, it, this black outline is anywhere where the depth changes. So if you have a, a part of the structure in front of another part, it will have a black outline. And that helps see depth. Um, so. Um, you can toggle that on and off. It's a pretty subtle effect, but I like to use that when making images. Um, I think uh, Chimera X made this soft lighting. That was its initial smart display. It decided soft lighting would work better. Sorry, it made full lighting. I can see a shadow being cast on my structure, a single spotlight shadow. Um, I'm going to switch it to soft lighting for the image, just slightly um, less shadow complexity. All right, so now I've got, an, now say I've got it, what I wanted to show. I would, of course, work on the position of the thing, depending on what I wanted to show. Uh, how can I save this image? If we go to the home toolbar, one way is in the home toolbar, there's a snapshot icon. It's the fourth icon from the left. And if I click that, then on my desktop, this, it made a file image1.png. I can make a lot of snapshots, and we'll just call them image one, image two, image three. Um, 
So that snapshot icon is a quick way to like save images. This image has the same resolution as it appears on my screen. And if I were doing this for a publication, they want it at 300 DPI or some pretty big image. So I could um, instead uh, save the image using a command at whatever resolution I want, like bigger than the screen resolution. So I can say save, um, say um, spike, uh, I'll call it spike dot png or dot jpeg or dot tiff whatever format you need and then i can say width and then i say in pixels how much width so i might a big image you know if it were 300 pixels per inch and i was going to make it five inches that would be 1500 pixels i could say width 1500 here and um, hopefully that will appear on my desktop oh whoops Okay, I didn't say to put it on the desktop. I didn't see it on the desktop. I'm gonna say save tilde slash desktop. It's at the top of your screen. Oh, it's at the top? Okay, it's covered by my Zoom images, so I yes. didn't see it. Okay, I thought it was supposed to save it by default. Let me um, get rid of these Zoom images of people's faces. Uh, so yeah, here it appeared on the screen. If I click that, I've got this bigger size image. Let's see if you actual size yeah so give me that's how to get a higher resolution image there are other options i could make a transparent background if i wanted to overlay this on something else with a transparent option to this save command all right so that's a little bit about how to make nice images um let's see in the tutorial i i talk a little bit about hydrogen bonds how to show hydrogen bonds i think i'm going to wait till the end of the tutorial for showing that. And I think we'll jump into looking at the electron microscopy maps. Um, actually, I think I'm going to jump into plugging in my laptop so it doesn't go dead first here. Hold on just one second. There is a quick question. Can, can you yes. um, save the images PDF format? Um, Chimerics will not export as PDF. So you would have to. Um, use a use a, like a PNG image and use a separate program to to get it in PDF. For instance, well, yeah, there are many ways you could get it into PDF other programs. If, yeah, well, I mean, if you if you're on a Mac, if you open up in preview, you can save as PDF. Yeah, that that's a good, good example. All right. Uh, other questions? Okay, let's look at some electron microscopy. I told you at the beginning, this is one of the main um, strengths of Chimera. A lot of the users of Chimera X, um, like say if you compare to, if you're familiar with other programs that do molecular vis visualization like PyMol, the, um, dealing with electron microscopy data and also uh, the many sequence, like sequence alignment capabilities. These are some things that Chimera X really excels at compared to the other programs. Uh, so let's look at the elect some electron microscopy. This spike structure came from electron microscopy. Uh, unfortunately, the spike, the map, we can fetch it just how we did before. We can say open, and then we give an ID, this time from the EM data bank. It's 22910. Um, but it's big. It's um, 220 megabytes, and that would take you a while to fetch. And so I made a smaller version of it. I just trimmed it down and reduced the resolution a little bit. It's only seven megabytes because I figured there might be a hundred of you of you trying to fetch it and it would take a while to get the 200 megabyte version. So if you go to the tutorial um, and scroll about halfway down to the electron microscopy section, I have a link to the seven megabyte file. It's under the section here. Here, let me center this a little bit better called electron microscopy. Um, and near this picture, whoops, sorry about that. I just, okay, near this picture, yellow picture of the map. To get to the, if you don't have the tutorial pay, um, uh, uh, page, I'll just remind you if you went, if you go to the Chimera X website, there's a link to tutorials. Let me just go, go back to that. Uh, here, let me just go to a different, let's say Chimera X. 
and this link that says tutorials, and then the third one down says nanobody. Okay. So that this is where I'll, you'll find the link to that file. All right. If you don't get this uh, map, don't don't worry too much about it. Or if you're if it takes a while to get it, don't um, don't panic. You can pick it up pick up where we where we are when you when you finally get the map when it's downloaded. All right. So I'm going to uh, here actually I'll, I'll download it and do it the way I'm suggesting that you do it. So. So I'll download this emd22910 trimmed.mrc and uh, okay it appeared in my downloads here and then I'm going to open it in Chimera X. I'm in the home tab of the toolbar and I'll click the open button or I could use fi menu file open and um, Let's see, let me go just navigate to downloads. And here's this EMD 22910 trimmed. And I'll open that. Okay, and it looks like it's kind of hidden underneath my model. In the models panel, it now it says 7KKL. I'm going to hide that, the little check button on the line that says 7KKL so that I can see my map. So this atomic structure we're looking at was solved using this EM map. Um, as I mentioned before, with the X-ray map, so we're seeing the same volume viewer. It's the same kind of data, like a 3D array of values. We can move the threshold level. And one of the main, one of the important uses of Chimera X is to deter, to help, uh, help in the process of determining these structures. And so what I want to show you is how would we um, start to get that atomic model that had the nanobody bound if we had had this kind of EM data. And so what we're going to do is some fitting. We're going to take a spike structure of the coronavirus, one of the, I think it's the very first spike structure that was solved back in February of last year of 2020, February or March. And we're going to try to fit it in. It doesn't have the nanobody, but this is realistically how when you're working with the electron microscopy data, you take pre-existing structures and you fit those pieces in, and then you adjust them so that it matches the density map. We're not gonna show all the little adjustments. This is like a project that could take weeks, um, but I wanna show you some of the initial steps and capabilities that Chimera X has to help. So let's open a structure um, that is the spike, um, but without the nanobody bound, that, was solved previously. The PDB ID is 6VXX. Open space 6V as in Victor XX. So I'll do that. Uh, let me make my window bigger again. Okay. Okay, so they're not aligned with each other because they came from different uh, experiment, experiment or experimental data. Um, and I want to fit the atomic model, which is shown in this pink ribbon into the, the green map. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I think I'm gonna, how about I hide the ribbon and show all atoms. So the toolbar, hide ribbon, we've done this a bunch, show atoms. And I'm gonna show the atoms as sphere style. Uh, I do this just so it's this space filling depiction so it looks closer to what I see in the map because I'm going to try to align them. My first step, I'm going to try to align them by hand. All right, so uh, to do that I'm going to use a mouse mode and I'm simply going to drag it by hand. So let's go to the right mouse tab of the toolbar and um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. I want the one that says move model. So movement at the, the category at the far left of this long toolbar it says movement. And I'll click on move model. This moves the selected model. Okay, we have two models. We have the density map and the atomic model. So I'm gonna select the one, one atom. I don't have to select all of them. It's good enough to just select one. So I'll just control click on one atom. And now, with the right mouse or on my Mac, I can hold the command key and use my trackpad. I can drag this model around. 
Ooh, and it's super slow. Okay, we saw this before. We know the culprit. This is the um, that ambient shadow of calculation. As I move one around, it has to recompute these shadows. And even with fast graphics, if that's being done on the graphics card, it can still be pretty slow. So I'm going to go to the home tab and go back to my simple lighting. Ooh, that's ugly. And I'm going to go back to black background. I hate going back to simple lighting. OK, but the advantage is I can move this thing around really fast now. And um, you, you might have noticed, you should have noticed, that the spike atomic model is upside down relative to the map. OK? Uh, so let me flip the uh, atomic model around. Sorry, we have a guest speaker here. My my cat, Mr. Catman, is uh, is decided to meow me to death. So hold on, just one second. Hey, could you could you take Mr. Catman and and close the door? I appreciate. It. Go ahead, just get him. You want uh, to you want to and just and close my door. And thanks. Sorry, that was cat, Mr. Catman. He. Um, okay, so. Uh, so right mouse or hold the Alt key or Option key, and I can translate. But how do I rotate? Uh, if you hold the Shift key, then it will switch to rotation mode. And then if, if I release the Shift key, I can translate. So I, uh, it's kind of a, um, you know, holding multiple keys down when you're using the trackpad. It's a little bit tricky, but it's, it's pretty nice. Um, to be able to rotate and translate. So I'll overlay them. And then I'm, I'll release all my keys and just rotate both models normally. And then I might make some adjustments to get them aligned a little better. The alignment doesn't need to be really good. It's, I just want an initial uh, position that's roughly correct because I'm gonna then computationally optimize that in the in next step. Okay, so this looks plenty good to me. Um, and so now let's do this local optimization. Um, we could do this by a command, um, or there's a user interface panel um, that can do it. Let's do it with the user interface panel. I don't think we've done that much in this tutorial so far. If we go to tools, volume data, fit in map, Then a pan this fit and map panel appeared here at the bottom. Um, it says fit 7KKL into this map. Um, 7KKL, that was the original structure. Remember, we're working with this 6VXX. So I need to change this. I want to fit 6VXX, model number three, into this map. And then I just press the fit button. And the map just jumped, or the atomic model just jumped into a new position. It takes just a second to compute. It did a local optimization that, that rigidly rotated and translated the, the model so that it maximizes the average density value at these atom positions. Okay. It's a, it's a simple, like local kind of gradient ascent um, calculation. Um, so that's why we had to get an, an initial good reasonable position. If we had the spike upside down, like the atomic model upside down relative to the map, and we did this local optimization, it isn't going to flip it 180 degrees. Um, it will only, it might move, it, it, it's range in my experience of convergence, you have, how close you have to get, you probably need to get within like 30 degrees or 45 degrees of the correct orientation. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's uh, let's see. I wanted to color the uh, atomic model by chain under the molecule display tool uh, toolbar. Let's see. Zoom always pops up a little extra toolbar. You guys can't see, but it blocks my my use of Chimera X. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna click the color by chain. It didn't actually do something because I remember I selected a single atom. It colored, it changed that single atom. So this is a 
something you always have to look out for. If it didn't seem to work, maybe you had something selected. So I control click on the background, then I color by chain, okay? And uh, I also, I'm a little puzzled. I, this Chimerics version is confusing me. I thought the maps come up gray when you have one map, but I'm gonna color the map. Well, let me do it a slightly different way. In the models panel, I, I wanna change the green color of the map to a grayish or whitish color. Uh, in the model panel of the map, the second line says EMDB22 blah blah. The little green button is the color button. So I'll click that and then I'll just change it so I got a gray color. Okay. And um, okay, so the fit looks decent. Let me lower the threshold level. I'm going to move. I, I don't need this fitting dialog anymore. So I'm going to close that. Let me move the little vertical bar on the uh, on the histogram in the volume viewer to get a different threshold level. And so I can see um, somewhat how well the atoms match up with the map. Not really well, but uh, I mean, I don't see it very super clearly. Um, one, one way to, um, okay, so one of the um, common things um, people show when they're looking at their electron microscopy uh, maps is they'll color them, um, like they'll color the different proteins. Um, and how do we do that? Let's, let's give that a try. Um, so I've got this atomic model fit, and what I can do is I can color the map to match the atomic model, okay, the colors of the atoms. So let's, let's do that. Uh, actually, I'm going to change the threshold so there's not the noise, um, the little speckles of noise in the map. Um, uh, so in the daily build, there's a button on the map toolbar. Uh, I think it's called Color Near Atoms. And I could just click that button and it would do the job. But we're not using the daily build. So let me do it the hard way. And the command is color space zone. Then I say uh, number two, that's the map. I want to color. Uh, and then I say near um, number three. Okay, that's the model I just fit in. All right, this is just like that volume zone thing we did earlier. So let's do that. Um, okay, and, and let me hide the 6VXX in the model panel, the little check button to show and hide. I'll click that. And so now I've got the map colored. And uh, let me go back to the soft lighting to get a nicer three-dimensional view. Home tab, soft lighting, okay. Um, the coloring, the distance away from the atoms that it colors, it's probably three angstroms again. Uh, we could check the documentation on that, but let's just add to this command. The command's still there. I just type into the command line at the end and I'll add um, distance six, distance space six, another option to, and that colors it out to a further distance. So now it's, there are not so many speckled gray parts of the map. But if I look at the top of the map where the nanobody is bound, that's still gray. That didn't get colored because the spike, the 6VXX structure we fit in doesn't have that nanobody, okay? So this, was, this is a, um, sometimes a useful thing when you're working with the electron microscopy. You, only have, you might know only some of the uh, proteins that belong to your complex. You color those and the remaining part uh, is, you know, a, other proteins that you have to model in, okay? In this case, we have that X-ray nanobody structure. And so we can do the same procedure. I, I can take the 7KKJ nanobody structure, open it, uh, delete one copy, and dock it into this part of the density, first by hand to approximate position. That's gonna be much more difficult than this spike because the spike had threefold symmetry and was easy to see the right position, but it's not so easy with the nanobody. Um, but it can be done and, and um, then use that fit optimization. And that would get me a starting model, a starting atomic model, which I would then refine to get the structure that the authors, Ashish, Manglik, and his 
large team of people and collaborators uh, produced for uh, the nanobody bound. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, coloring. Okay. Let me take a look at my notes. I just want to see if I where I am. What what next here? So. I have some steps in the tutorial about doing that um, docking, but I'm going. I'm not going to um, do it. We've already seen the basic steps involved of hand moving and then optimizing the fit. Let's take a look. Let's um, let's cheat a bit and take a look at. Let's take the nanobody X-ray structure, and can and compare it to the the structure that the nanobody has when it's bound to the spike. All right. Uh, because interestingly, it changes uh, its shape, its conformation quite a bit. Okay, so um, I guess uh, uh, let me hide them. Let me um, let me show our initial seven kkl that structure and hide the map. I just clicked on the show and hide buttons in the model panel, and. Um, let me show the uh, spike here as a ribbon. So in the home tab of the toolbar, I'm gonna hide atoms and show ribbon. And let me bring in the, uh, the X-ray model. Remember I typed close after the, at the break and that got rid of it. So let's reopen that. I'm gonna say open 7KKJ. And I didn't see it appear because it's probably far away. There it is. It's way far away. So I zoom out. And remember, I have two copies of the nanobody. And I'm going to just want to fit one in. So I'm going to delete one of them. Let me show you a way to delete one of the copy. Uh, first, let me, I'm going to remember it had chain A and C on the nanobody. I could, I could see that in the log or I could mouse over. Let's see, let me zoom in here and mouse over. I'd see it says, this is chain A, this is chain C. I'm gonna delete chain C. Here's how, if I go to the select menu, it says the second thing down says chains. And then I'll go to, uh, that rolls over to synthetic nanobody. And then uh, go down the very last entry, it says 7KKJ chain C. So this is just a way to select chain C. I could have control clicked and did the up arrow, but I just wanted to show you a different way to do it. Okay, so that should made the green outline. And then to delete it under actions, atoms and bonds, at the very bottom of that menu, it says delete. That will delete the selected atoms. There's an undo in Chimera X, but one thing you can't undo is delete. So be careful when you do your deletes. I'm gonna delete. By the way, here's under edit, here's undo. So I, it says I can undo selection, but and I can undo coloring and I can undo changing the display style to cartoon and ribbon. I can undo a lot of things, but not delete. Uh, it's just a limitation. Okay, so I have one nanobody. How do I get it aligned? with the nanobody in this bound structure. I want to align it and see how well they match. Um, so there's a really, this is a really useful tool. You often need to do these alignments between related structures. Um, there's a command to do it. It's called matchmaker. Um, let's use the, the user interface panel for matchmaker though. It's under tools and um, structure analysis, matchmaker. Um, this is a little bit fancy because um, you often want to align two structures that don't have the same sequence. Like they might be from different species um, or one might be a mutant. And so the first thing this tool will do is do a sequence alignment between the two you want to you want to match up. Then it knows which residues correspond. Then it will do a rigid motion that optimize that reduce that minimizes the C alpha distances between the pairs of residues. So uh, in this dialog, um, I want to specify the exact chains that I want to align. This tool can also guess which chains you want to align. I want to specify the exact one. So where there are these three check buttons at the bottom, at the bottom it says 
um, chain pairing specific chains in reference structure with specific chains in match structure. And then the reference structure, that's the one that stays still. That's this spike, which is uh, 7KKL and let's say um, nanobody uh, chain B, say. And then the over on the right, this menu, I choose the X-ray structure, 7KKJ chain A. That's the one that's going to get aligned. And then I can click OK. And it jumped, it moved the nanobody uh, X-ray structure. So into alignment with the, the um, chain in the spike structure, the bound one. OK? Uh, just to give you an idea um, that um, sometimes, you know, that panel was complicated and it had a lot of options. And it's good if, you, if, you, uh, if you're not sure what all the options are to use that panel. But it, once you're sort of a little more expert and know these things, I would normally have done that. I would type MM for matchmaker. That's like an abbreviation for the command that, um, or you could, uh, you could just say match. I'll say mm match uh, number four, number sign four slash a, that's the x ray structure, to um, number, let's see, what's my, it was the first structure, 7KKL, number one, chain B. Okay, that's how I would have done it, because it was a lot quicker to type that command um, than bring up the user interface tool. Um, but that's only if you're sort of get more familiar with the program so that you remember these commands and what the syntax of the command is. All right, um, let's get a little bit clearer view. Um, I told you that the bound state of the nanobody is a lot different than the X-ray structure. Um, it's a little hard to see because we have three copies of the, um, of the spike protein and three copies of the nanobody making up this structure. So let's hide, um, let's hide the ones that were not, um, that are just sort of in the way. Let's just keep, um, let's keep the copy of the nanobody and the, the bound copy. And let's keep um, just the purple, the one copy of the spike protein that's interacting with that nanobody. How do I do that? Um, well, this is a, uh, different ways. I think one of the easiest is would be to type a command. I can say hide. And then um, I want to hide the chains of the um, of the spike. And they are um, they're D. Uh, actually, I let's see. Yeah, I have to actually look at what those chains were. So let me go back up to the log. Well, I could hover the mouse over them to find them. Oh, that log's got a lot of stuff. Okay, right. I have never, I've never quit, so I have all of the stuff from. Uh, blah blah blah. Sorry, it take a little while. Oh, that's the six VXX. Okay, I skipped it. Darn it. All right, log is too long at the moment, so uh, I don't think there's a search for the log. Uh, so let me just uh, hover over. I see chain C, to chain D, a C chain. Um, chain A is the one I want to keep, and the nanobody chain is B. Um, and so I'm going to say hide. I know so A and B are the ones I want to keep. So I'm going to say hide slash C through uh, through F. I think that covers all the chains. C dash F. Hide those chains. And I have to actually say that would normally hide just the atoms. I say hide slash, I say cartoon at the end, space cartoon, because I want to hide the cartoon style. You can hide just the atom style. If you say hide slash C dash F, it hides just the atoms. You can hide just the surface. Instead of saying cartoon, you can say surface. So the hide command takes this extra option. All right. And now I, I just have a clearer view of how the nanobody is bound to the spike. And the green x-ray model you see has this uh, loop that is in a, a really completely different configuration than, um, 
than the loop in the actual bound structure. This isn't really surprising. Antibodies, when they bind, the variable loops that recognize the, what the target that they're going for, they are very flexible and they adapt to the, um, the shape of the, of the receptor or their target. Uh, but this gives you a better picture of exactly how big those changes are. This alpha helix here um, is in a totally different configuration. All right. Um, okay, so that gives you an idea of um, a little bit about how to work with the electron uh, microscopy, how to look at uh, binding, uh, how to work with the atomic models from the beginning of this webinar. Um, I, I had one more section showing you the hydrogen bonds. Um, so Chimera X can tell you where are all the hydrogen bonds, which um, are between the nanobody and the spike. The hydrogen bonding is important in the affinity of the nanobody for the spike. They're very important. I think they're uh, seven, six or seven hydrogen bonds, but we're running a little short of time. I don't want to run over. And so you can, you can do those steps from the tutorial if you like. Um, they're, in, they're kind of in the middle of the web page, not at the end. I was just leaving it to the end because I thought we might run out of time. Um, but uh, here, maybe we can do something very quick that will give the idea at least. If you go to the molecule display toolbar, there's an H bonds, okay, hydrogen bonds icon on the right. It says analysis, okay. If your Chimera X window is kind of small, um, like not as wide as mine, those might not appear in the toolbar. Let me just show you what that looks like, like this. And there's a little... Um, a little double arrow sign on the far right that brings up the extra icons if they don't all fit, okay? Anyways, if you click the H bonds one, it will compute where it thinks hydrogen bonds should be in this structure. It will compute where the acceptors and the donors are, and it will display them as these dashed blue lines. So it takes a few seconds because there was a lot of computation going on, and a disadvantage of using this toolbar button is it's showing all of them. In the log here, it says it found 6,400 hydrogen bonds. Like all the beta sheets are connect, are like formed by hydrogen bonds, the alpha helical structure, like there are tons of hydrogen bonds. And I want to really narrow down to the hydrogen bonds between the nanobody and the structure. And that takes a little more effort. And I would use the hydrogen bond um, GUI panel, okay? That's under tools, um, structure analysis, H bonds. Okay, it has a lot of options. And uh, if you follow the instructions in the tutorial, you can see just the specific hydrogen bonds that this nanobody is making with the spike. All right, uh, so I think that's the what we have time to cover. Um, I wanted to mention a couple more things. Um, if you have more, um, uh, specific uh, questions about Chimera X. One good source is tutorials. Um, you can go to the Ch Chimera X webpage where we went. You can run tutorials within Chimera X. So if I go to the help menu in, uh, and then tutorials, this will bring up a browser. It's not your standard browser. This browser is in Chimera X and, um, and what that allows it to do is this browser can run commands. Um, so for instance, here, let me type, I'm gonna close all of our current models, close. I type close at the command line and I'll go to this quick start tutorial. And there are links here, it says open to BBV. And if I just click on it, it will run that command. So it just opened the structure. And then if I change, click this next command, it will run that command. So many of the tutorials, you can just click through and it will do a whole bunch of things and show you Chimera X functionality. So, um, so it says contains click to execute links. Many of these tutorials have them. They cover a bunch of different topics. We only talked about a small fraction of the Chimera X capabilities. Um, so uh, that, that's a good resource for learning more about Chimera X. If you have additional questions, there's a user a mailing list. Um, 
the it's an email address chimera x dash users at cgl.ucsf.edu. Let's see, there's probably a help uh, contact us that will give you that mailing list information. So that's really good. Elaine answers a lot of the questions there, and so do I and other users too. Okay, um, I think we're out of time. Sorry, I used up every single second. Um, are there any uh, questions to, before we call? The, call no, I the think day? Elaine, Elaine has been answering them as we've gone along very uh, yeah. rapidly. One question I would just thinking about this, and uh, I'm not sure how we do it, but could you, can you say uh, have links or commands in say a Jupyter notebook and then use uh, Chimera as a way of displaying the structures and things like this? Yeah, so um, what I showed you with those links in the tutorials is very similar to, to Jupyter Notebook. So uh, we don't have a Jupyter Notebook interface right now to Chimera X, although there is a, a Python command shell. Okay, Chimera X is based on the Python language. If you are familiar with that language, you can access all of the Chimera X functionality from Python. And under tools, general, general shell, um, it will bring up this Python shell and we can uh, get the list of models and things like that from the shell um, and do things with it if you know Python. And, um, but, but this is, and this is actually related to Jupyter Notebook. It may even be um, part of that Jupyter project, but it's not uh, it's quite as nice. Um, other, any other questions? Last last questions. There was a, a, a question which um, uh, Elaine answered, but maybe worth commenting on is um, um, if people want to develop um, things for Jupiter, what would be their best approach if they want to do to to uh, modules or extend it and things like this to be able to use Jupiter Jupiter Notebook and do Chimera. No, X sorry, extendings? sorry, but Chimera X. How could they contribute? programming, basically. Oh, how could they contribute? Okay. Yeah. Oh, very good question. Um, so a big part thing I did not emphasize was we um, really encourage outside developers. So if you, uh, so an example, so, um, so uh, if you go to tools and more tools, there are a bunch of things contributed by outside developers. This Strudel score measures quality of fit in EM maps. And uh, let me just scroll down the top download. Isolde uh, allows you to refine with molecular dynamics, atomic maps, atomic models into maps. Okay, this molecular dynamics viewer shows MD trajectories. These are things contributed by other people. Um, they're written in Python and you can submit they're called bundles. Okay, it's basically just a plugin. You can submit a plugin. And there's user documentation. If you go to the Chimerix documentation, there's detailed programmer documentation about the APIs. Um, let's see, if I go to help programming manual. Okay, so there's the code is on GitHub. There are tutorials about how to do programming with uh, Chimera X. So we really encourage and support developers. Um, and we'll, we'll help you online. I mean, send email to Chimera X users. And if you get stuck when you're trying to do some Python um, with Chimera X. But, sounds yeah, fantastic. We, we would love, we would love you to like utilize the many capa underlying capabilities of Chimera X to do new things. Okay. okay. Any, anything more? No, there's a couple of comments of thanking you for a great workshop, but uh, and uh, I'd like to add to that. I thought it was fabulous. I think uh, uh, it's often when you see these sort of applications on the web and you download them, they can be a bit intimidating. But I think having these sort of uh, tutorials actually gets everybody started and then you feel a bit more confident and you're just quite happy then to point and click and find out what happens. Yeah. I think I hope if, if you learned anything from this, and maybe you're even like you've used the Chimera, our older Chimera program, uh, it should be that you poke around at the toolbar. You just poke all the buttons and you look at all the toolbar buttons because you can do an amazing. It's a it's a really good entry point to doing a lot of things in Chimera X. Yeah. 
Okay, that's great. Well, I'd just like to thank you and Elaine for your uh, all the help uh, for today and the, the presentation. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. I'd like to thank uh, Liverpool Chirochem for funding it because uh, without them, it uh, becomes difficult to put all of these uh, workshops together. And uh, I guess an, on a broader sense, uh, many thanks to all of the open source programmers everywhere who contribute towards all these things because they uh, provide an absolutely fabulous resource. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you Tom. very much, Chris. Okay, so and then for everybody else, well, there's a, a, another workshop next month. Uh, it's going to be done by uh, Greg Landrum on uh, structural validation, absolutely critical step in any model building. So if you haven't signed up already, I encourage you to do so. And thank you again, Tom. I'll uh, close down the um, uh, webinar now and uh, let you go and have a cup of tea or something a little stronger, maybe. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.